So welcome. Uh, my name is Bill Norton, and I'm with uh, the National Center for Constitutional Studies. Um, and uh, it's just great to, to have you here, and I want to welcome you to this presentation on Freedom Stories. Uh, throughout the afternoon, we're going to share with you a little bit about the importance of stories and, um, and why storytelling is, is so critical. It's a green light and a clear track for the friendship train as it rolls across the salt flats of Utah and roars over the endless trestles spanning Great Salt Lake. Mile after mile over America's great west speeds the train that is our personal answer as a nation to the hungry of Europe. Through the snowbound rangeland of the cattle country, this mighty symbol of America's generosity rolls ever eastward. Everyone has helped. Railroads have hauled the train free. Unions have donated labor. Civic organizations have banded to fill the cars with the needed food. The spirit of 48 states is in this enterprise, and at every stop, enthusiastic crowds gather to hear Drew Pearson, originator of the Friendship Train. All have worked. The big people and the little folks have pooled their efforts to fill the cars. From whistle stops off the main line to the metropolitan centers, cars are loaded with food and more food. Flour, milk, dried vegetables, dried fruit, canned vegetables, rice. These are the staples that pour into the friendship train night and day as it grows steadily, car by car, en route to the Atlantic seaboard. America's pioneers of the vast West once knew the meaning of hunger. Today, their descendants remember. Hundreds of thousands have joined in the mass effort, and the friendship train grows ever longer after each stop. It carries to Europe not an official government aid program, but the answer of a free people who have heard the cry of their neighbors to want. It is the free will offering by an America that wants to share. Has anybody ever heard of the Friendship Train? Isn't that a great story? 1947, so not very long after World War II, um, Europe was just in, in ruins. And so they hadn't had a chance to really get their crops going again. And so uh, it was a very difficult time for them. And the uh, federal government had begun working on a plan called the Marshall Plan. And it was a slow process, just like uh, everything that you go through, you know, federal government is. And they were having a difficulty uh, kind of getting things going real well, but it was government to government. And there were all kinds of strings attached between uh, our country and France. And so finally, uh, Drew Pearson, who was a journalist uh, at the time, uh, a broadcaster, he came up with this idea that we should just get the American people going after this thing. And so that's exactly what we did. We, uh, uh, he started this friendship train. And with what was taking the federal government months and months to do, uh, he ended up putting this thing together in a matter of weeks. And then it was just only a short time that this friendship train went, went across the country and, uh, and gathered a number of train cars full of goods. So you'll see uh, all this great news and things that, that, that took place at the time. And you've got these... these Different stories about school children getting all their, uh, this food together. Milk kept coming in, all that canned milk. High school boys helped load Friendship Train. Just an exciting time. Everybody started contributing uh, to this cause. Originally, Drew believed that uh, we'd end up with about 80 cars. Well, by the time it was all said and done... Uh, nobody really knows the exact figure, but there's somewhere between 240 and 270 train loads or train cars full of materials to be sent to Europe. And a number of different countries uh, actually benefited from it. France uh, and Italy were the, were the number one countries, but there are a handful of other countries as well. Uh, and so it's just an amazing thing that took place in our country. But as we've discovered this story and we ask people, have you ever heard of the friendship train? It is a lost story. Uh, very, very few people know about it, and there's a couple of people that have some websites uh, up, and they've been very excited to talk to us uh, because they're like, oh, nobody knows about this, and finally somebody's asking, and so it's, very, it's, a, it's a real neat story. Some other pictures here of the Friendship Train being loaded up. The 
Please at Independence Hall, the cradle of liberty in Philadelphia, welcome a section of the friendship train carrying America's gift of food for a hungry France and Italy. From the cars, the goodwill gift is transferred to a ship. And on the dock, Drew Pearson and Mayor Samuel of Philadelphia see Mrs. Pearson name the United States line vessel the Friendship. Next up on the food ship's route is New York, where additional loading swells the cargo to a total of eight million pounds. This is the first of the four ships which will carry the 500 carloads of food donated. The second will sail to Italy. The line is providing transport free as its part of the friendship gesture. At the New York ceremonies, thanks from his grateful country is extended by Ludovic Chancel, French Consul General. The gifts from America's heart, which were gathered from every state in the Union, set out to relieve the hardships and hunger of an old ally across the sea. So it's always exciting when you, when you uh, discover these wonderful new stories. Uh, and it's exciting, to, especially when you know that they're on the brink of being lost. And the amount of Americans that participated in this was just remarkable. Uh, but yet, once you discover it, it gives you this amazing connection uh, with others. And so that's kind of what we're here for today. We could spend the entire time talking about various stories about the Freedom Train. Uh, and uh, there, there's a, a lady that we've come across who uh, is, is quite old at this point, but she was actually participated uh, in it on, on France's side. She was the one that actually received a lot of the, these goods and determined where many of them were going to go. But we don't have time to focus just on the friendship train. We're going to share with you today a little bit about stories and why stories are so important and how they uh, connect us and how they affect us in our lives. And so we hope that you enjoy uh, this afternoon with us and learn a little bit more about storytelling. To begin with, we're going to start with... Um, uh, with, we're, a number of people are going to be participating up here, and we're going to start with Tanya Nelson. Now, Tanya Nelson is with the National Center for Constitutional Studies. And as I was trying to figure out, okay, how to introduce her, everybody's saying, well, she's the story expert, and she's the one that's... Uh, I, 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 she's married to somebody else that's involved with, with uh, NCCS, and I didn't want to introduce her as just Jeremy's husband. Well, <laughs> Jeremy's wife, sorry. You know, we've been talking about all this same-sex marriage stuff, and... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Jeremy, Tanya. <clears throat> so anyway, Tanya, she's, uh, she uh, is the mother of uh, six children, right? Homeschools those children, so obviously she knows a thing or two about storytelling and how important it is in instilling those stories into the hearts and minds of her children. So with that, Tanya. Well, I've had the wonderful opportunity of talking with many of you during this week, and I hope that you remember the conversations that we had and not that I'm Jeremy's husband. <laughs> really, as I've thought about this amazing week, everything about this week has been amazing. But when I go home and someone says, what was the best part of your week? There will be no question in my mind. The best part of this week was meeting wonderful people and connecting with them by finding out about who they are and the wonderful things that they are doing with their life. As I've had the wonderful opportunity of talking with many of you this week, a question that has often come up has been, how did you end up here? What's the story that ended with you being in Salt Lake this week, participating in this World Congress of Families? And so I would like to share with you now the story that brought me here today and the story that has led to my involvement in Freedom Stories. My story, like all of yours, begins many years before I was born. And the place I have chosen to start was about 60 years ago. And this is a story of a little boy, sorry, a little boy who loved the story of the little red hen. 
his mother told him about the little red hen who found some wheat. And the little red hen didn't know what that was, but she asked around and she found out that if she took these seeds and if she planted them in the ground, and if they were taken care of, they would grow up and they would produce wheat that could be ground and made into bread. And she knew that she wanted that to happen. So she went around to all the animals and she said, who will help me to plant the wheat? Not I, not I, not I. And so the little red hen said, well, I will do it myself. And the little red hen did. And then the little red hen said, well, the wheat has grown. Who will help me harvest the wheat? Not I, not I, not I. As the story goes on, at each step, the little red hen asks for help, and every time, the animals reply with not I, and the little red hen replies with the same answer, then I will do it myself. This little boy learned that he would go out, and if no one else would do the work he saw needed to be done, he would do it. One day, his mother sat down with him, and she handed him a notebook. And we have given each of you today a notebook. And she said, son, you are learning about the heroes of history. You are learning about the greatest lives that were ever lived. I want you to take this notebook, and I want you to write down the names of those people who have used their life to build great things, and that those things have come down and bless you today. And so he took that notebook, and when he learned about a hero, he wrote it down in his notebook. And he wrote down what they did and the things that he wanted to do so that his life would pattern theirs. One of the people he learned about was George Washington. When Alexis de Tocqueville was in America, he said, America is great because America is good. He learned that George Washington was great because George Washington was good. He learned stories of George Washington helping his troops, not just standing by the wayside and telling them what to do, but he learned stories of George Washington getting into the fight, doing the work himself, and leading by example. Just like the little red hand, George Washington would say, if no one else will do it, I will do it. <clears throat> so after this little boy had learned about George Washington, imagine how happy he was one day when his mother sat him down and said, I want to show you something. And she showed him a letter that had been written by his fifth great-grandfather. His name was James Hyde. And in this letter, James Hyde talks about his personal feelings for George Washington. Now, James Hyde was 15 years old in January of 1777. A few months before he reached that age of 16, when he could enlist, he insisted, I'm ready, Mom. I'm going to go and fight this fight. I'm going to do the work that needs to be done. And he enlisted in the Continental Army. He was there that winter in Valley Forge. He suffered with the troops. He was there at the Battle of Monmouth in the attack. He felt the confusion when they were, had a distinct advantage and Lee betrayed his country and said retreat. He was there. He saw George Washington ride in and say, wait a minute, this is not what we're doing. Turn around. And he was there at Yorktown. He saw the fog lift, and he saw the white flag of surrender. He stayed with the army until the peace treaty was signed. And the letter that he left for his family expressed his deep appreciation that his release papers were signed by his hero, George Washington. Now, several years later, this little boy grew up, and he married a woman who was equally committed to being the little red hen and doing the work that needed to be done. And one day, 
a group of people came to this man, and they said, we have put together a book. We have a story that needs to be remembered by America. We've put together a book, but we don't have any money to publish this book. Will you help us? This was a significant commitment. And as he thought about this decision, as he prayed about this decision, his mind went back to that notebook. He knew that George Washington's story needed to be preserved and told. And he went back to his parents, and he said, Mom and Dad, we know James Hyde, our ancestor, told us that George Washington is a good man. We need to remember his story so that we know who we are. Will you help me in this? And together, along with his wife, they made the decision that they would make the sacrifice and take the risk to make sure that George Washington had the opportunity to tell his story. Now, the man that I have been speaking about is standing in the back of the room. This is my husband's father. And he is also the man who's responsible for each one of you receiving the 5,000-year leap when you came to this conference. And I'd like to ask his wife to stand as well. And she also deserves a thank you. This is the book that was printed because he was willing to put everything on the line. About five years ago, I read this book. And for the first time in my life, I read another story that needs to be remembered. And that was the story of Henry Knox. When George Washington was defending the city of Boston, and the British had taken over Boston, and George Washington was trying to find a way to come in and liberate Boston. Henry Knox knew that 300 miles away in Fort Ticonderoga, there, was, there were cannons. And he said, we can do it. We can go get the cannon. They're 300 miles away. It's frozen. We have to cross a lake. We have to cross rivers. It didn't matter. He went... He found those cannons, and he brought them back. Along the way, some of them fell to the bottom of a lake. He raised them back up. He didn't have oxen and teamsters. He hired them. He used his own money. And when he got back, George Washington was able to use those cannons to liberate Boston. The first time I read this story, it touched me so deeply that immediately I told my children this story. And the next morning... My little boy was helping my husband carry heavy boxes, and as he stumbled under a heavy load, Jeremy came and said, would you like me to help you? And this little five-year-old boy with heavy boxes in his arms squared his shoulders, and he said, no, Dad, if Henry Knox can get the cannons, I can carry boxes. And that day, I learned the power of a story to teach my son to be the little red hen. This week, we have shared stories with each other, and we have connected together with our stories. Let's not let that end. The reason we are creating this project is to connect us all through stories. Thank you, Tanya. That's, Tanya, that's fantastic. Um, and Zeldin and Mary Lynn didn't know that she was going to tell the story like that. So um, what, what an uh, incredible example. That's exactly what we're here today, this afternoon, to talk about is connections, how important stories are and how they connect. Um, and so it's, it's important that we recognize... Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. okay Kimberly, just, you're always no, interrupting no, no, me. Give me the microphone. Okay, okay, I have a connection. Okay. Okay, all right, I never know if they're going to stop me. Okay, so, Mayor's the, the um, friendship train. Landed in France in 1947, just before Christmas at the time when the people of France needed it most. They were hungry, they were cold, 
they didn't have any means to be able to, to produce more food. It was in the middle of the winter, and they didn't know what they were going to do, and it was at the edge of their hope. What are we going to do? So the train arrives, and it was like a big burst of rainbow. Hope on the horizon. They could feel it. They were so grateful. As the train would go to each city and the food would be pulled out and they would deliver them, they couldn't believe it. And they were, they were so overwhelmed with gratitude and compassion for their brothers and sisters across the ocean who had thought of them at this time of need. So they wanted to do something to thank America, those families of America who had given. And so a man by the name of Andre Picard, who was a French rail worker and a war veteran, decided that he was going to create an opportunity for the people of France to say thank you. And so he created what became known as the Merci train. The Merci train started out as one car. And they thought, okay, let's fill this car and let's send it to the people of America. What is fascinating is that these people who were struggling at the most difficult time in their families' lives wanted so much to give back and say thank you that six million families contributed to this boxcar, which went from one to 49. By the time it was done, they had those 49 boxcars, one for each state, in the United States, and one, the 49th, would be shared between Washington, D.C. and the territory of Hawaii. Alaska was not yet a state, or they'd have one, too. <laughs> there were 52,000 gifts. So what were these gifts? The people of America gave food. What did they give? Well, here's just some ideas. Children's drawings, worn shoes, hand crocheted doilies, jeweled legendaire once presented to Napoleon, the bugle, which signaled the armistice signing in 1918. 50 rare paintings. The first motorcycle ever built. A Louis XV carriage. The city of Lyon provided dozens of silk wedding dresses. The president of France contributed 49 delicate Sevres vases. And one little girl, one little girl gave a doll that had been in her family for three generations. Her grandmother played with it. Her mother played with it, she played with it, and then she gave it to America. These families didn't have hardly anything. So what did they give? They gave pieces of their lives. They gave themselves, and they shared them with America. When the trains arrived in New York Harbor, the president, who was um, President Truman at the time, um, said that he wanted to create a duty-free um, opportunity for this ship to come in. And so the ship came right in the New York Harbor to great fanfare. There were uh, Air Force planes that flew over, and the fire boats shot up the water, and they had little fill boats all over. And it was just this huge, wonderful welcoming. Now, the French rails are eight inches wider than the American rails. So the train cars couldn't go on to the rails and go across the country. And so they put them on flat cars and took them across the country to each state. And every place they landed, there was a French representative that met with the members of the community of that state. People traveled from all over, tell us where it's going to be. And they would come and they would see. There were parades, there were celebrations. It was this grand connection between brothers and sisters across the ocean helping each other. And as the ship came in to the New York Harbor, it carried the big, broad message, Merci, America. So, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> um, Many of these boxcars that were given are still on display in many of the states today. The artifacts preciously preserved. In fact, we tried really, really hard for the last three days to get some of the artifacts from the state of Utah. But on such short notice, they held these gifts so precious that without them personally bringing them, they would not let us have them. That's how 
cherished these things are. If you live in the United States of America, go to your state and you'll be able to see this precious gift. We may never know the individual stories of the people on both sides of the ocean who were touched by this magnificent gesture that sprung spontaneously from the heart of one nation for the benefit of the other. We may never know the lives that were changed, the hearts that were softened, the burdens that were lifted. What we do know is that the friendship train was evidence of a spirit and a people whose generosity was recognized around the world. And the Merci train was a powerful evidence of the spirit and sacrifice of a people whose gratitude is still remembered and immortalized in state houses and capitals across the country. A man whose love for, and for, and a man whose love for his fellow men led to uniting a nation to support their brothers and sisters across the ocean just at the time when they needed it most. And in turn, those families across the ocean, overwhelmed with gratitude, found purpose as they shared a part of their own lives and their own stories. It is the perfect representation of God's children coming together in love and brotherly kindness. And you thought that just the friendship train was a cool story. What's amazing about this is when one story ends, another story begins. And so what was a great story for America became a great story for France. Uh, and, and we had this great connection between two countries back and forth. And so uh, what a great, a fantastic example of stories and how they, they connect us together. Um, now, there's a few different types of stories that we want to talk about. Um, because it's important that we recognize these types in order to, to really instill in people uh, the education and knowledge and emotion and things that we need. And so first of all, we have familiar or personal stories. And then we have imaginative stories. And then there's historic and or heroic stories. Now, we gave each of you a, a little uh, notebook of your own, just like the notebook the Zeldin had as a child, and, uh, and we're encouraging you not only to kind of take notes, as I see you are, but, but what we really want you to do with those notebooks is as we're sharing some stories with you, it's going to, to make you think of some stories of your own, and we want you to just kind of jot down a, a few notes on that, and, and, and because toward the end of this afternoon and our time together, uh, we're going to invite a couple of you uh, to share a story or two uh, about uh, along these lines, uh, familiar or personal stories, imaginative stories, and or historic stories. And so we, we hope that uh, some of these stories that we're going to share will kind of get your own minds and hearts uh, moving as well. Now with that, since Kimberly so rudely interrupted me there earlier, um, I'll formally introduce her now. Uh, Kimberly Fletcher is the president of Homemakers for America, and they do a, an amazing job going around the country talking about the importance of mothers uh, in our culture. Uh, if any of you were there this morning uh, when I spoke in the main session, I talked about how mothers really uh, can affect our culture to a large degree. And so that's, that's the work that Kimberly does. That little paragraph that I did was written just for her. Um, so she does a fantastic work. So Kimberly is going to share with us a little bit about uh, familiar or personal stories. My husband has always wanted to see the Grand Canyon. I'm sorry, folks, but I just don't understand the big appeal with a crack in the middle of the desert. And, oh, first stop. Good job. I don't understand the appeal of a crack in the middle of the desert. Maybe you're from Arizona and that offends you, I'm sorry. But I am from Pennsylvania and I think green and bushy is beautiful. And so every time he'd say he wanted to go to Arizona and, and, and see the Grand Canyon, I was just like, whatever. And the sad thing is we went through Arizona several times back and forth from the West Coast to the East Coast visiting families right through. Probably could have just leaned over and maybe seen the crack in the distance and we never stopped. And he kept, he, he kept saying, we need, to, we need to stop. We're going to be right by the Grand Canyon. We need to stop. And I had no interest. And because I had no interest, we never stopped. And so my son moved to Arizona. And we went to go visit him. And after years, years, like 20 years, of hearing him talk about the Grand Canyon, he brought it up again. And honestly, just to make him stop, I said, fine, work it into the schedule. We'll go see the crack in the middle of the desert. So we got to Arizona um, near, near sunset, and 
he didn't even want to go to the hotel. He wanted to go straight to the crack in the desert and go look at it. And I was kind of irritated because I'm like, you know, it's been a long day. I want to get the kids in, get checked in. But okay, the kids looked excited about it. So I put on my happy face and okay, let's go have fun. So we get there. And the sun is going down, and there's this long, windy path, and we go through with these bushes, and then all of a sudden, it opens up into this vast expanse where you can stand along and look at the big crack in the middle of the desert. And that was the first time that I personally witnessed the majesty of the Grand Canyon. I was overwhelmed. A lump formed in my throat, and all I could think was, oh my gosh, how (laughs) dumb have I been? Look what I have missed. I I just stood there, and I, I couldn't say anything. I was just overwhelmed. We sat there until the sun went completely down. It was dark, and we started making our way back through the path, and on the way, I saw this little sign that had a light on it that said, sunrise, 6, 10 a.m., And I looked over at my husband, I grabbed his arm, and I said, I want to come back. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yes. 6, 10 a.m. And so the next morning, I wanted to make sure that we were there at 6 a.m. because I didn't want to miss a thing. And the day before, he had just run right by me to get to to see the Grand Canyon. But that morning, I was running past him because I didn't want to miss one moment. The path was a lot darker and a lot more difficult to navigate because it was still dark, but we made our way through, found a nice comfortable spot as we waited for the first ray of sun to come over the horizon. I sat there in anticipation, and then suddenly the pink hues began to appear in the distance, and I sat there in absolute awe as I watched the sun rise over the Grand Canyon. It took my breath away. It truly did. I don't even know how to explain a moment like that in words. You just have to be there. But I remember sitting there and thinking, this is me witnessing the majesty of God's hand. It was incredible. I had just finished reading a book um, by a man named Viktor Frankl, who had been in the concentration camps in World War II. He was a Jewish psychologist. It was interesting because he tells his story from a third, as a third party position. He was a psychologist who endured all of these trials, and yet, as the psychologist, he was like stepping back and looking at human behavior and why people behave the way they do. And he said that at that time, through all the trials and things that they suffered, it was the little things that gave them hope and kept them going. A blade of grass, a sunset, a cool breeze. And they would stop and say, oh, look at that beautiful sky. And that's all I felt right then. It was like everything was more beautiful and and then he said people became more grateful, and, and they wanted to help each other, and they'd give their last little crust of bread or the only blanket that they had. He said there were few, but it was magnificent to watch them because they had a purpose, and he has a quote in his book called Man's Search for Meaning that says, when a man discovers the why, he can suffer anyhow. And he was... Um, he was a great inspiration to me, and that's, that's what I thought. He, you can bear almost anyhow. The people who gave to the Merci train, that's, that's what they found. They found something bigger than themselves, a purpose, a reason, a why to be able to go through the how, to make it through. And the, when they gave, it was like, infusing them with gratitude. They were sharing their gratitude and it filled them. And the people who put all those things on the friendship train, they felt the same thing. Every time they loaded their little cans of milk or the storekeeper came out with his bag of flour, 
They were filling themselves with joy and beauty. That w- those were my thoughts as I sat there looking at that sunrise at the Grand Canyon. I was like, no problem was too big to bear. No challenge was too hard to overcome. And I started counting every one of my blessings. And I wanted to be better and do better, be more and and do more to show that gratitude. I was just filled, literally, with gratitude. I've since found a quote by a man named Thomas Tapper that says, "There were now and there will now and again come a scene to us. Come, I'm sorry. There will now and again come to us a scene, a remembrance, so full of beauty and pleasure that we shall feel rich in the possession of it. And at that moment, that is exactly how I felt." So our next stop is imaginative stories. <clears throat> now, imaginative stories are, are just wonderful. I, I'm, I'm somebody who has a, a great imagination. That's why I, there's some things that I fear because I've got such a great imagination. Like, I don't like large bodies of water because I have such a vivid imagination that I can just imagine all those things that are underneath there that are going to get me. Um, so there's sometimes when imaginations are tough. But, but an imagination... Uh, is very important, and it's been important in my life. Um, so imaginative stories were instrumental uh, for me, continue to be instrumental for me. And a couple of the stories that I remember as a child, uh, Tanya told the story of the little red hen. And so through that story, I remember learning a good work ethic, reaping what you sow and helping others, and the importance of that. Um, so I've grown up and, and, and have continued to have a pretty decent work ethic. My brother and I own a, a custom concrete company in, in uh, the Phoenix area, and we've been doing that for about 28 years. And, uh, and so I find that, that some of these things I learned from some of these stories, these imaginative stories, um, has helped me throughout my life when it comes to business. Then you have, of course, the tortoise and the hare, right? That also teaches you a good work ethic. You've got this story where the tortoise and the hare challenge each other uh, for a race, and the hare thinks, there's no problem, I got this made, and he's just kind of sitting back the whole time, and then he decides uh, to take a nap because he's so far ahead of that tortoise, and then when he wakes up, he realizes that the tortoise is almost to the finish line, and so he gets up and he runs as fast as he can, but it's too late, the tortoise crosses that line. And so we learned a number of good important stories there, a good work ethic, uh, don't th- take anything for granted. Uh, and they also uh, persistence, remember? Trotting or trotting or slow. There's a number of ways that the, that the uh, story ends, but, uh, but, you know, slow and steady wins the day, that kind of thing. Now, as I've gotten older, though, I kind of have a little bit of a problem with this story because as I've studied uh, the Constitution and principles of liberty, I'm, I'm a natural law kind of guy. So I do have an issue with this story because it totally violates natural law that this tortoise is actually beating the hare. And I want to tell you, I'm not alone in that view. Uh, I'm in good company with somebody who believes that it's also uh, against and violates natural law. The tortoise wins! Yes, folks, the tortoise always wins. Yeah, the tortoise always wins. How does he do it? I can't understand it. It's against the laws of nature. Well, you just ain't in the cards. A tortoise beating me, a rabbit. See, it's against the laws of nature. That's what I'm trying to tell you. <clears throat> well, what a great story. I also remember this story often, um, my mom telling me about this. I don't know if she was telling me about this because she felt like I needed to really learn this lesson. I don't know. I think I was kind of an honest kid. But, but nevertheless, the boy who cried wolf, uh, this young boy who just gets tired of watching the sheep, and he's getting kind of sick of sitting there all the time, and he just wants some entertainment. And so he decides, hey, I got, I got something Fun little, wolf! He starts yelling wolf as loud as he can, and boy, all those villagers, they come running, and they've got their pitchforks, and they're ready to, uh, to, to defend the flock. And he's just laughing and laughing. He thinks it's just hilarious. 
And then all the, they, they get a little upset with him, and they say, all right, you need to stay here and keep watching the sheep. And so he goes back. They all go back to the village, and he's getting bored again. Wolf! He starts yelling it. And so the villagers come running again. He does that a couple of times until finally what happens? A, real, a wolf does come. And the villagers, when they hear him crying wolf, they ignore him. Oh, he's just playing the joke on us again. So not only does it tell us that we should always tell the truth, but we cannot believe a liar even when they are telling the truth. So it's not a matter of telling the truth at the moment. It's a matter of, of, of creating this character, being honorable all along the way. Uh, and so that, I remember, taught me a lot. You'll notice a lot of these stories that influenced me have to do with, with hard work and work ethic. So again, you've got the grasshopper and the ants teaching a good work ethic. Be prepared. Um, store for, in, in good times for the bad times. Um, I always kind of felt a little bad for the grasshopper, but I did think he got what it was coming to him. Uh, but I remember this story often as a child as well. Now, these are all uh, stories or fables that, that teach a value or moral. And that's one great thing about imaginative stories, is we can take something that's familiar, familiar stories, we've got the rabbit and the hare or farm animals, and then we can connect them uh, to, to something that's just kind of fantasy. And so it's great that we have this opportunity uh, to teach values and morals. But the one thing I remember most that I think I got, got the most out of these types of stories wasn't necessarily the values and morals, but the imagination itself. One of my favorite stories was where the wild things are. So I'm going to share this story with you. Many of you probably grew up with this. If you haven't ever heard it, then uh, you're in for a treat. So the night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. I always love this picture where he's going to eat the dog. I've always wondered if he actually catch the dog, if he would actually eat it. I don't know. His mother called him wild thing. And Max said, I'll eat you up. So he was sent to bed without eating anything. That very night, Max's room grew a forest. And grew and grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls became the world all around. And an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max. He sailed off through night and day, in and out of weeks, and almost over a year, to where the wild things are. And when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars, and gnashed their terrible teeth, and rolled their terrible eyes, and showed their terrible claws. Till Max said, be still, and tamed them with a magic trick of staring into their yellow eyes without blinking once. And they were frightened and called him the most wild thing of all and made him king of all the wild things. And now, cried Max, let the wild rumpus start. Now, when I teach this or read this to my kids, we then commence to run around the house growling and yelling and having a great time. And we'll do that and then we'll stop it until I turn the page and discover we still get to do it. And so we'll do it a little bit more. And then we turn the page again and discover we still get to do it, and so we have the wild rumpus a little bit more. It's a lot of fun. Now stop, Max said, and sent the wild things off to bed without their supper. And Max, the king of all the wild things, was lonely and wanted to be where someone loved him best of all. Then, all around, from far away across the world, he smelled good things to eat, so he gave up being king of where the wild things are. But the wild things cried, oh, please don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. And Max said, no. The wild things roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. But Max stepped into his private boat and waved goodbye and sailed back over a year and in and out of weeks and through a day and into the night of his very own room where he found his supper was waiting for him, and it was still hot. What a great imaginative story. I used to love that as a kid. Well, I still love it as an adult. Imagination. Um, I'm someone, as I've grown up, I, I've uh, 
done a lot of uh, different artistic types of things, uh, anywhere from authoring uh, uh, curriculum and, and books and, and also doing graphic design. Um, I build. I like to tinker out in my, in my uh, garage. And in fact, uh, over half of the furniture in our home I've, I've built. Um, but I've never followed a plan because my plan's always in my head. I have this, this imaginative ability to picture it all in my head and then turn it into something real. And I found that that's a very valuable uh, tool in life, is to be able to do that, to take something and create it spiritually, so to speak, before you create it physically, to be able to visualize it in your head. And so I've tried to instill that uh, in my children. And I've got four children and and, uh, two sons. And my youngest son, he is seven right now, but when he was five years old, We've discovered that he's got this, this great ability to picture things or to imagine things as well. And when he was five years old, here's a picture of him when he was five wearing uh, one of my hard hats. He just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. But he approached me with this drawing. Now it looks like a five-year-old drew it, right? And I'm looking at it. I, I have no idea what it is. So I ask him, what is it? And he was just so excited to tell me. And then I suddenly realized as he's telling me, how complex this drawing really is. It's a plan for a toy airplane. And he's got step-by-step plans here. Here's the fuselage. And then he decided before you put the wing on, you probably need some kind of a block to, build, to, to set it up higher than the seat. So he determined you need some kind of a block there. And then you can put the wing on. And then you can start putting some of the, the uh, tail and, and the, uh, the, the wings on the back. Um, and then, I don't recall this was, I think this was the, uh, something for the wheels. And then you'll see these engines that he put uh, on the outside of the wings there. And then he painted it red to conclude uh, his, his piece. And he numbered uh, the, uh, each step, one through eight. Now, this is, this is pretty cool for a five-year-old to actually be able to take this, picture it in their mind, and, and to put it down on paper. So, of course, we wanted to, to, uh, to cultivate this, and so we went to the store, my son and I, and we purchased the wood that we needed to follow his plan, and we went out to the garage. And as we took each piece, I went ahead and showed him how to shape things and make them look cool and make it look very realistic, but we followed his plans step by step each way. And by the time we were finished, we ended up with this little toy airplane. Now, like I said, I helped him kind of figure out how to shape things and make it look a little bit more realistic than a five-year-old's drawing, but we did not veer from his plans or the steps of his plans at all. The only thing that we added was we decided once we built it, we realized the wings were a little unstable, so we came back in afterward. And, uh, and put the, uh, the supports there. And then we also realized when we were putting the engines on toward the outside that those engines looked better uh, being moved in just a little bit. And so we made a couple of alterations as we went along. And then also it's blue, not red, for a couple of reasons. One, because by this time um, he liked blue better than red. But also I didn't have any red spray paint. And so we uh, went with the blue. So it's, it's been wonderful to see Uh, as I grew up learning these imaginative stories to cultivate my imagination and now to be able to pass that on to my children, to be able to visually see things and create things uh, throughout their lives and and, and, and so that they can understand that they have the capacity to do so. Now our next stop are historic or heroic stories. So for that, I'd like to introduce Dan Sheridan. Now, Dan Sheridan is working with us on a number of different projects, the Freedom Story Project, but also a a project called My Freedom Frontier. Uh, Dan has a background in radio, so you'll notice he's got a great radio voice. If if you can't stand listening to him, just close your eyes and it'll be great. If you can't stand looking at him, I should say. (laughs) Um, Dan's fantastic. Uh, He's involved with NCCS as well. And, uh, and we're happy to have him on the team. Dan, share a little history with us. I'm not Bill's husband, no. <laughs> Mark Twain once said, I would have written you a shorter letter if I had enough time. 
And that's what this story is for me. It's impossible to get this story in 10 minutes. I have to leave out so much. And that's the problem with it, but I hope it gives you enough. On a September day in 1791, the fifth to be exact, there was a rich Virginia slaveholder who was on his way to a Virginia courthouse, and in his hand he had one of the greatest freedom documents ever written, and yet very few people today know the man or his document. And this is going to be one of the greatest tragedies in history that we hope to revive. Now, keep something in mind. At this time, 1791, you know who was in office as president? George Washington. That would be nice today, wouldn't it? Ink was still drying on the great freedom documents of the era, such as, let's see if you can guess, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Who can finish it? Every one of you. What document is that? Everyone knows that document. The ink was still drying. And great speeches were still echoing in the minds of the people of the day who heard them firsthand, such as, the war has already begun. Our brethren are in the field. Why stand we here idle? What's that? Patrick Henry's liberty or death speech? That still echoed. So did James Otis's fiery speeches against the writs of assistance. So did John Adams' righteous defense of Captain Preston and his men. So all these great speeches and these great documents were still fresh. But the man we're going to talk about in his document were a little bit different. The man's name is Robert Carter III. How many of you have ever heard of him? Look at that. His document, The Deed of Gift. How many of you have ever heard of it? Isn't that amazing? And when you're done here, you're going to say, why didn't I know this? Something about this document you need to know. One, it's not eloquent, and there's no oratory to accompany it. Actions are its spokesmen. Actions. And what do we always say about actions? They're louder than words. So what's so special about this document? The deed of gift freed over 500 slaves and provided for them. More slaves than would ever be freed until the Civil War, and Robert Carter did it without firing a shot, and yet he was fired upon. He suffered greatly for what he did. His actions were not popular. So who was this Robert Carter? Robert Carter was neighbors with George Washington, Light Horse Harry Lee, Robert E. Lee's uh, grand father or grandfather, I forgot. Great men. He was also friends with George Washington. You know, he, uh, excuse me, with Thomas Jefferson. Do you know he played in a quartet with uh, Jefferson at the governor's mansion? And the governor at that time took uh, Robert Carter as his protege. Robert Carter read the same books, took part in the revolution, supported the Stamp Act resolves, and did everything he could for America's freedom. When his wife handed him British tea, he spit it out. That was Robert Carter. He hung out with all these people, read the same literature, took part in that freedom movement. Yet we all know the names of Washington. We know the names of Jefferson, but we don't know Carter, do we? We don't know Carter. How is it possible that this man is unknown? Do you know how I learned about Robert Carter? I love history. I teach history. I found him in a footnote of an old book over 100 years old, and it doesn't mention what he did. It just mentions that he did something in the colony that had, it was totally unrelated to his great act. Even the great historians of the time, Douglas Suthoff Freeman, how many of you ever heard of him? He wrote the great, one of the greatest works on George Washington. He only mentions him briefly, but he doesn't mention the deed of gift. Nobody mentions him. So how is this possible? And I believe the reason why Robert Carter is unknown is because he's an inconvenient truth. But remember what Patrick Henry said in that same speech. I want to know the whole truth, the worst of it, and to provide for it. And that's what we have to do with the story of Robert Carter. Why is he unknown? What's the truth behind it? 
Carter proved that emancipation could be done if you were willing to sacrifice on behalf of others at your own expense. Carter proved it can be done. People make excuses, well, why didn't they free the slaves? This excuse, this excuse. It was perfectly legal to do it, and Carter do it, and he is the example of why it could be done. And guess what? He had the most to lose because nobody came close to owning the same amount of slaves as he did. Washington and Jefferson didn't even come close combined. And he did it. He acted. That's what Carter did. There was a window of opportunity, but in 1793, something was invented. Who knows what it was? The cotton gin. And with the invention of the cotton gin, laws started to be written saying slavery is legal, and it's illegal to free slaves. And then it led to over a half a million lives eventually being lost on the fields of Gettysburg and Antietam, and all those wasted lives if only people had the courage and the heart that Robert Carter did. He said, this is inconsistent with Christianity. I shouldn't be owning them, and they need to be freed. He was hated for it. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute, close your eyes. I want you to imagine a man with leg irons and chains. I want you to imagine people in that day meeting at parties and discussing means of torture against slaves to get truth out of them. Men who went from church to parties and discussed how to torture their slaves to get things out of them. The first presidential candidate, James T. Burney, who was an uh, anti-slavery candidate, wrote a book called The American Churches, The Bulwark of Slavery. They were in the act too. Let's not be behind the freedom frontier. Let's be on the front lines. Why are we on behind them so often? And when I learned the story of Carter, I said, i got to find out if there are people living today who descended from that deed of gift. I found one. And her name was Latanya Jones from Virginia, and she was telling me how she found out. Her cousin went to law school, and he had to trace his genealogy through nothing but legal documents. And what she tells me, it's very difficult for black people to find their genealogy before the Civil War. So he's doing the research. And all of a sudden, he's in 1840, 1830, 1820. They got relatives. They're free. They own land. She couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. And he traced it all the way to the deed of gift. And they descend from two families that united afterwards, and they were neighbors. And she's here today. And she's got a, a site now devoted trying to find the descendants of the deed of gift. And the link's on the website, by the way. You can see that. So his legacy's with us. George Washington made provision in his will to provide for the freeing of his slave. Do you know who he hired as a lawyer to do it? The same man that Carter used to create his deed. He influenced Washington, I'm sure. This man, Robert Carter III, has no monument, nothing to mark his grave. You can't walk through Gettysburg without tripping over a, a stone with a monument or something like that. But there's nothing dedicated to Robert Carter III. You guys remember the story of Mordecai in the Bible? King Ahasuerus couldn't sleep one night. He was tossing and turning, and they got out the, the, the chronicles of the kingdom, and he heard what Mordecai did, and he says, What has been done for this man? And they said, what? Nothing. Mordecai saved the king's life and nothing was done for him. Robert Carter III has a cone of silence about him. But we're going to revive his memory. He's, Latanya Jones said this to me on the phone when we were talking. Robert Carter was ahead of his time. And what I learned from Robert Carter is don't let that door of opportunity close. If there's an opportunity of you to be a champion of freedom on behalf of others, do it even if it costs you your life, your reputation, your money. That's what Carter teaches us. She said he was ahead of his time, and let's pray he's not ahead of ours.
So you've heard the examples of, of those three different types of stories. Um, isn't that fantastic stuff? Don't you love hearing stories that you've never heard and you like to rehear stories that you've heard before a thousand times? Stories are fantastic. Now we're going to invite uh, Marlene Peterson to come up. Marlene Peterson is with, um, she's with Homemakers for America as well, but she's with the Libraries uh, of Hope. You guys do a lot of work together, mothers, and you mothers just band together, don't you? Um, but she's with Libraries of Hope, and uh, she'll probably tell you a little bit more about that. But really, the, the goal there is to resurrect many of these stories. And so she's got a number of books uh, of uh, just hundreds of stories that were written over the last couple hundred years that, that have kind of been lost and have, are out of, out of print. And so she is one of these great uh, story resurrectors, I guess we can call her. Um, so Marlene Peterson... that story resurrector I, and I also like microphones that are on a stand so you won't see my hand shaking but uh, we'll just do what we can um, yesterday in the plenary session I I invited you here because I told you that we were going to be launching a project and I hope that your mind is starting to connect what you're seeing with what that project may be that what we intend to do is to start a new friendship train only this time, uh, instead of loading the train with food and supplies and blankets, we intend to load it with stories. And we want to take these stories around the world, and we want to be able to connect with each other, um, because that is how we connect with each other, is through stories. So what I'd like to do is take just a few minutes. You've heard um, several different examples of stories, three different examples of stories, because these are the kind of stories that we want to fill our train up with. And Jeremy, when I get, when I get done, is tell you, tell you more of the technical part of that. Um, but the first kind of story you heard was the personal or the familiar story. And that is the easiest. We all have these personal stories. You know that usually it's family stories. You meet a stranger and immediately you're connecting on your kids and what you've been doing. We all share stories of, of, um, of grief, of hopes, of dreams. So these personal stories are very easy to come by. Um, you cannot know me if you don't know my stories. And I cannot know you. But once I know your story, I'm going to understand you, and I'm going to love you. To know someone is to love them and to connect to them. As human beings, we crave to be connected, and that starts at a very young age. A few weeks ago, my oldest daughter called me, and she said, uh, thanks a lot, Mom, for the book you gave me. Do we have the book up here? This was a sweet little storybook about putting all the animals to bed on the farm. And um, she sat down with her little one-year-old Savannah and read through it. And her Savannah made her read it over and over and over 17 times in a row. She, every time she tried to close it, she would scream. And so my daughter finally got her to go in the backyard and play with her sisters. And she put the book on the bottom of a big pile of books. And when her little girl came back in, she threw all the books off pulled out the book and insisted that she read it again and again. So my daughter and I were talking, trying to figure out where this fascination with the book was coming from. And it dawned on us, we had just gotten back from spending several days up in Pennsylvania Amish farm country. And this little girl had been petting baby lambs and baby ponies and goats and chickens and ducks. And and it had rolling fields and golden sunsets and barns. And we thought, what she's doing is connecting to those memories. Those were happy, happy things. And as she looked at these, the stories or the pictures, she was connecting and reliving that. Another example. I was talking to a young woman that uh, was, uh, worked at a museum. And she said she hated pioneer stories. She really did, and, and this was actually a church history museum. <laughs> and she said that uh, one day she saw an old woodworking tool that was used by a pioneer, and it looked just like a tool that her grandfather had used. And suddenly there was the connection. And she says, I don't know why it did it, but I loved pioneer stories after that. 
These connections are vital, and these familiar stories help us connect at a very basic level that we are sharing common, human, everyday experiences. So first of all, we invite you to share personal stories with each other. And our hope is that as you get on there, you'll find out that whether you live in Amsterdam or Nigeria or Germany or Russia or America, we're alike more than we're different. We love our families. We want good. We have dreams. We have disappointments. We have sorrows. We share that in common with each other. Now, the second type of story that you heard was the imaginative story. In child development, it's important that you go through these steps. You start with the familiar, and then the next step is to take the familiar and to add on to it something that you have never seen before. Because what you're doing is you're forcing the mind to start creating its own pictures and its own images. And like Bill so, so very, describes so very well the importance of that imagination, the ability to create Im images in our mind because there is nothing in this world that has ever been created that didn't first exist as an image in someone's mind. Imagination is vital to civilization. Um, without imagination, we have no dreamers. We have no problem solvers. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Even our empathy is dependent upon our imagination. Felix Adler wrote, much of the selfishness of the world is due not to actual hard-heartedness, but to a lack of imaginative power, the faculty of putting oneself in the place of others. The best imaginative stories come from the realm of fairy tales and mythologies. These have been polished and passed down for hundreds and thousands of years. And the most important part is that they have lasted because they are wrapped around kernels of moral truths. That the way that we can impress upon our children's hearts um, lessons in right and wrong and good and evil and justice and injustice is by telling them fairy tales. They are vital. You know, I talk to moms that they will not tell fairy tales to their kids because they say, we just need the facts. They, they don't do it. And it is stifling that imaginative power. It's critical. The fairy tales start uh, with something familiar, like I said, and then you add the unfamiliar. So you have the long ago and far away, there was a king with three sons. Or once upon a time, there was a woodcutter with a, a wife and a golden-haired child who lived in an enchanted forest. What does an enchanted forest look like? Well, your mind has to paint that. This is critical. Albert Einstein wrote, if you want your child to be intelligent, read him fairy tales. If you want him to be more intelligent, read him more fairy tales. <laughs> Our intention with Freedom Stories is not that we become a repository of fairy tales because they are out there. That's not a problem. What we would like you to do is share your stories of how, in, how fairy tales have influenced you or how they've influenced your children or your grandchildren. It's really a story of a story. And as you share those, I guarantee it will connect with someone else and they'll, they'll remember a time that they shared that story or it will make them think of another story and we'll start connecting in that way. Finally, we come to the historic or the heroic story. And these are probably the most important stories of all. And if you haven't, if you try and tell stories of history to your children, they may not care if you have bypassed the familiar or the imaginative years. Because the familiar stories, the stories of, you know, when daddy was a little boy and mommy was a little girl, they create the interest in stories. They help children love stories. So stories are a good thing. And then the imaginative stories, like I said, is building that capacity to be able to see and if you cannot see history, you're not going to care about history. You need to be able to bring the people and the events to life. Your heart has to be able to see these events playing through. And why does it matter? Well, in history, we've changed the way we dress, the way we get around the houses we live in. But what has not changed is human nature. And that means that anybody in history has a lesson to teach you on how to live your life. You don't study history because you need to 
You don't study historical events and people because you need to understand them. You study history because you need to understand yourself. It's going to be the, from the stories of history and the people, and these heroes can be real or fictional. They um, inspire us in the same way. These stories help us to see life from a thousand different eyes instead of through the narrow view of our own experience. It is the person who has a reservoir of stories that is broad and deep that is going to maintain hope in whatever life throws at them because when you have a story that is broad, a, a story reservoir that is broad and deep, anything that comes up, there's a story that teaches you how to get through, what you need to do, what qualities you have, that you always have hope. There's too many people that are trying to live and function off of a shallow puddle of stories. And they're the ones that when something comes up, they don't know what to do, their heart fails them. And they, they crumble up. They don't know what to do. These are vital. The best thing we can do for our children is to load that reservoir up. There's an old saying that says, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. If there's nothing down there, it's not going to come in the moment that you need it. We need to give them a lot of stories. So what we want you to add in our friendship train uh, for stories of history is just like Dan. How, how did a story, how did someone from history impact you? How did they influence you? What way did they help you to get through something that was difficult in your life? And as we share these stories, again, we'll connect around the world because one story will remind of another. So perhaps the story of George Washington and his fight for freedom is inspirational to you. Well, someone in South America can say, well, that reminds me of Simone Bolivar's fight for freedom in our country. And someone in Scotland will say, well, that reminds me of William Wallace. And you can start to see that we begin to understand no nation has an exclusive hold on heroes. We all have heroes. All of our nations have a story to tell. And if we're ever going to have peace in this world, we've got to know each other's stories because everyone has a fantastic story of struggle and overcoming, and um, it, will bind, it will bind our hearts together in love. And that is what Freedom Story is all about. It's about love. That is our vision. Love really is the answer. Uh, freedom Stories is not about freedom out here. It's about freedom in here. That's what we're about. While governments are out there waging war against each other, we intend to load a friendship train, family to family, heart to heart, and connect each other with our stories. And we need all of you to take part, to contribute your, your stories, to tell others around it, especially as you have friends around the world, that they can join and add their stories to this train. When the world is in chaos, and spinning out of control, it is the storytellers who will reset the course. As you help to spread stories of light and love and goodness, you are changing the world. And on those days when you're ready to tear your hair out and the frustrate, you're so frustrated at what's going on, we want to provide you a place that you can come and take a breath, and a break, and breathe, and get refreshed, and be connected with other people who also love goodness and light. And now yesterday in the plenary session, I um, told you I was going to tell you where you could find a lot of these old stories. And that's, how I, that's what I've spent the last several years, is gathering these old stories so that you can dig in there and bring them back into the light and share them with your families. So each of you should have had a, a bookmark on your chair. It says, um, storytelling is an ageless and beautiful art. On the back, it says, libraries of hope. And librariesofhope.com or librariesofhope.org will get you to my home. And um, this is the web page. And down at the bottom of it, you'll see three choices. There's training resources and online library. The online library is what I want to show you. If you'll go to the next one. You'll find six different library rooms. And within these library rooms are over 2,000 books from this golden age of children's literature from 1880 to 1920. And this is all free. It's all there for you to just go and access. And as you dig through these, you're going to find these forgotten history stories. You're going to find the forgotten fairy tales. And we hope that you'll use them and tell them and then come to the free friendships train 
the Freedom Story train and share the experience that you had. Um, then the last one, I mentioned that we're trying to help mothers relearn the art of educating hearts. And we've started a mother's story group or mother's study group. And if you go to the training page, each month we have a new topic that we invite you to come. I've got the books on there that teach you again from this age of heart education that will help you start to relearn these arts in educating hearts of children. I just want to make you aware of it. Just come look on our site. There are tons of resources, things for you, things for your kids. There's music, there's stories, there's art, there's poetry, and um, it's a labor of love. I hope you'll share it around. I hope you'll dig the stories out, and then you'll share your experiences with them, load them on our friendship train, and let's connect with a lot of people.